Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. U.S. President Donald Trump has nominated Dr. Aldona Vosch to be the next ambassador to Canada. It may take months for Vosch to be confirmed by the Senate. Since Kelly Kraft vacated her role, the chargé d'affaires, Richard Mills, has been Washington's top diplomat in Ottawa. We caught up with him this week to find out what's at the top of the agenda for our relationship with our closest neighbor. Joining me now is U.S. Chargé d'Affaires, Richard Mills. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Mills. It's a pleasure to be with you, Mercedes, and on West Block. Thank you. It seems like every time we talk to our American friends and colleagues, it's been about NAFTA 2.0, USMCA, Kuzma, depending on who you're talking to. A lot of people think that seems like a done deal, but I'm wondering if there's any bumps ahead on your radar or concerns the U.S. still has about implementation. Uh, it hasn't even been ratified here yet in Canada. You're right. We're not at the very end of the road yet. We are waiting for our Canadian friends to formally ratify Kuzma or USMCA, uh, and that'll be the end of the, the, the first part of the process. Uh, we're confident that that's going to happen. Uh, we believe there's widespread support for the USMCA agreement here in Canada among business, labor, government, all the stakeholders here. Uh, the next part will be implementation. That'll require hard work by the three governments, Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., but we're confident that this agreement, which really ensures North America remains an economic powerhouse into the 21st century, is good for all three countries and implementation will proceed smoothly. Do you have any concerns about the fact this is a minority parliament? So it's not as sure a thing as it was uh, previously. Now the Conservatives are looking like they're going to support it, but the Bloc has said they're going to slow it down. Does that keep you up at night at all? What happens inside the Canadian Parliament, of course, is for Canadian parliamentarians to, to decide, but we're confident that there is, I mentioned, that there's widespread support for the agreement and what it brings to American, Canadian, and Mexican workers and consumers. So we're confident that even in a minority government, there's widespread support to get it passed. When it comes to Huawei, the U.S. has made their position very clear. And in fact, the National Security Advisor, when he visited Canada back in November in Halifax, um, made it no bones about it, that he did not want Canada to sign this, that he believed Canadians' data was at stake and that it could affect the relationship with the United States. What would that look like? Because the decision hasn't been made. So if the government were to go ahead and approve Huawei, would the U.S. stop intelligence sharing, stop military collaboration? Paint a picture of that for me. Well, you're right. This is a very important issue for the U.S. government and for our relationship with Canada. It's, of course, it's a Canadian decision to make about who they're going to let into their 5G network and their 5G infrastructure. We've been very clear, quite honestly, that to let an untrusted vendor and supplier like Huawei into your system for us raises very serious security, intellectual property, even human rights concerns. And we've shared those views with our Canadian friends. You're right, National Security Advisor O'Brien was here in December in Halifax and I think he made clear that at this point it would be difficult to know what a Canadian decision to allow Huawei into the 5G decision would mean for our relationship, but he was frank that we would have to reassess the quality, the quantity of information that we could share with our Canadian friends if Huawei was in the system. Does that mean potentially intelligence restriction? Because Canada relies on a lot of American intelligence. It does. We rely on, on some aspects of Canadian intelligence. It's a very close relationship, uh, one of the closest we have in the world. That's why we care very much about what decision the Canadian government makes about who they allow into their 5G system, and Huawei in particular. Um, as the National Security Advisor said, I can't say w what the exact implications would be, but as I think he made clear, it would cause us to have to reassess and look at the quality and the quantity of information we could share. When it comes to the larger relationship with China, Canada, of course, arrested Meng Wanzhou on a U.S. warrant. Um, any sign that that extradition request may be dropped by the U.S. government now that the Americans are moving ahead with a trade deal? Let me be clear that the Chinese action in arresting the two Michaels, um, their action against the, the Canadian citizen, Mr. Shalom, um, is completely unacceptable to the U.S. government. 
uh, we have made it very clear that this is the kind of behavior that puts the Chinese Communist Party leadership, the Chinese government in bad, really a bad space around the world. And it really damages China's effort to be taken as a responsible member of the international community. And we think about the condition of those Canadians almost every day, to be quite honest with you. Um, but let me be clear, the decision to request that Canada honor its treaty with us, its extradition treaty, and um, bring in Mrs. Meng uh, was based solely on law. This was not a trade decision. There was no political... Um, but the president has indicated that it might be used for political leverage. Do you think that that's problematic? I think, again, this is a judicial process on our side. Um, I have seen no indication that we're in a position to bring in political or trade uh, issues into it. It needs to have the process finish out. We have great confidence in the British Columbian courts and the Canadian court system, and we'll see how the process plays out. But again, let me be really clear. This was a legal process uh, based in the U.S. judicial system, and we are very pleased that our Canadian friends honored the rule of law, stood by their commitments, and made what I know was a difficult decision, but they, I think, did the right thing by standing for the, the rule of law. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau had asked the U.S. government, in particular President Trump, not to sign any kind of a trade deal until Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were released. They are very much still in prison and the U.S. has signed an initial trade deal with China. The American government is telling Canadians they're doing everything they can to get the two Michaels released, but does signing that trade deal send a very different message about their value to the American government or the efforts being made to free them? I don't think so. Let me be clear, the President, President Trump has raised these cases at the highest levels in China. Uh, we have been very strong and very public in our concern about these cases with the Chinese government. We remain in close coordination with the Canadian government on what steps we should take. I know everyone is concerned that actions not be taken that might result in harsher treatment for those held, the Canadians held, the two Michaels. Um, and that remains our focus. How do we get China to change its behavior? I believe the Canadian approach, which has been to make this an international effort, um, as uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister Freeland has said, and as she was Foreign Minister, that Canada is working to get everyone in the international community to say this is an outrage against all of us. And I think that's been a good approach. Does the American approach undermine that, though, if you're telling China to behave, but there's no ultimate consequence for them here? Well, we're going to wait and see how the judicial process uh, underplays, uh, plays out, excuse me. And we will see what the courts rule. Um, we hope that uh, the fact that the international community is speaking in many ways as one will affect the Chinese outcome, and the Chinese will see that this was not the right approach to take by any means. When it comes to defense spending, the Trump administration, who you represent here in Ottawa, has been very clear and explicit that they want Canada to spend more. President Trump has said he wants all of the allies to be meeting 2% of GDP. Mm. Canada's nowhere close to that, and it doesn't seem to have a plan to get there anytime soon. You sent a demarche, which is unusual to the Canadian government, an official reprimand demanding Canada spend more on behalf of the administration. Why aren't you satisfied with Canada's defense spending in the United States? Well, first, I'm not going to comment about our kind of the diplomatic exchanges that we have with our good friends in the Canadian government. Uh, but yes, it's no secret that the United States, with all our allies, all 29 NATO allies and others in Asia, uh, we've raised the issue of a more fair burden sharing as we all work to preserve global security. And you're right, Canada made a commitment, as did the other 28 members of NATO, in March 2014, that by 2024, defense spending would roughly equal 2% of Canada's GDP. And we have been encouraging all our NATO allies to step up and do that. Uh, you're right, Canada is not near that a mark. Um, we were very pleased with um, some of the uh, defense spending that's occurred under the, this government, uh, including some effort to buy a new frigate, um, some new airplanes. but. To be quite honest with you, Mercedes, they are not, Canadian government's not on course to meet 2% by 2024. In fact, they probably will reach a peak, our estimate, around 1.4% 2024, and then decline rapidly. This is important because our common security requires common burden sharing. 
And we want to see our Canadian friends in Canada have a voice in international relations, have a strong voice because we share the same outlook, we share the same values. But to be listened to, there has to be something behind you. And that requires investment in the military. And so that's, it is an important issue and you're right, it's one we'll be discussing um, in the coming months with our Canadian government friends. The National Security Advisor raised the Arctic as well when he was in Halifax as a significant concern for the Americans. There, there's more Chinese and Russian presence up there with global warming. We're seeing melting, which means there'll be passages opening you couldn't get through before. Is there a risk that if Canada doesn't do more to defend the Arctic, the Americans could step in? Well, this is Canadian sovereign territory. This is Canada's uh, responsibility, and it would not be our place. To, to tread on Canada's decision about how it defends and protects its sovereign territory. But I do agree with you, and the U.S. government agrees, that the Arctic is becoming a new area of uh, concern, an area that we need to look at. There are new challenges and opportunities there. Our goal for the Arctic is, is simple. We'd like to see the Arctic remain a peaceful, secure, geographic part of the globe. Uh, open to sustainable, responsible development and uh, with strong economic stewardship and at all times listening and being respectful to the native peoples of the Arctic. Uh, the primary forum we do that in is the Arctic Council, uh, the eight member uh, forum that brings together the eight Arctic nations. We do believe, to be honest with you Mercedes, that the Canadian government perhaps should look at what's happening in the Arctic. We're seeing more I think Russian, Chinese presence there, both soft power and even some hard power. And that requires that we think about how we're going to defend the Arctic region. And just you mentioned the 2%, NORAD, which is a great symbol of our relationship and our military security. NORAD is a joint military command between both governments. It needs to be modernized. It hasn't been modernized in several decades. And money spent on that would go toward Canada's broader alliance 2% commitments. So it might be an area that the government would want to look at. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau commenting on the Ukrainian jet that was shot down mm -hmm. by the Iranian military uh, was asked by our national anchor Donna Friesen about it. And in response, he said something that caught the attention of a lot of Canadians and Americans. Um, when he was asked basically who was at fault, he said that if recent escalations, without recent escalations, those Canadians would be home. Some people thought that he was blaming Donald Trump when he said that. What did you think of the Prime Minister's response? Well, what I thought was important was the Prime Minister's subsequent statement where he said that it was not the responsibility of the United States, that Iran was responsible for the shoot down. That's certainly, I think, what uh, any, any person looking at the situation would have to agree. Iran is responsible for the safety and the security of civilian aviation in its own airspace. And we fully support Canada's efforts to make sure there's a thorough, incredible investigation into that incredibly tragic event, which I know has brought so much heartbreak to people here in Canada. I realize you're here in Ottawa, but I know you're very connected in the State Department. And I wonder if you know uh, if the Americans have been placing any pressure on Iran to release those black boxes. Uh, to be honest with you, Mercedes, I know we've offered our assistance to the Ukrainian government and the other governments that had citizens on the plane that was shot down. Uh, I'm not sure what the, the exact call or ask on our to us has been, so it's difficult for me to comment. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Mercedes. It was very good to talk to you. Thanks. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching. For the West Block, I'm Mercedes Stevenson.